MEI is uh, very honored to be partnering with the World Bank again, um, actually to discuss their recent uh, report, more jobs, better jobs, a priority for Egypt, and what could be more timely. Uh, this report highlights the need for structural reform within the labor market to respond to the different trends in both in Egypt and the region um, caused by the tumultuous political uh, tectonic shifts and the uh, demographic uh, realities that the region is facing today. We're lucky to have with us today a panel of experts who will discuss the World Bank report and its impl implications for policymakers and mostly for people. Uh, today's event is part of the Middle East Institute's uh, deep dive uh, focus on Egypt, uh, particularly Egypt's social, economic, and development, developmental issues um, as it faces uh, challenges in the future and challenges in the present. Uh, we've programmed panels on the economy with the World Bank uh, and uh, with other partners and ourselves uh, uh, this year, and we will continue to do so uh, in the future. I'd like to invite you all, in fact, take out your, your cell phones just for a minute before you turn them off, and put into your calendars September 12th, because the Middle East Institute will be hosting our second annual Egypt conference at the Park Hyatt Hotel, and we'd like you all to come to that. We'll also be looking uh, on, on one of our panels uh, in that uh, conference will be on the economic challenges that uh, Egypt is, is facing. So please come to it. Um, I'd like to now turn the podium over to our colleague, uh, Inger Anderson, Vice President of the MENA uh, uh, Directorate at the World Bank. Uh, and I invite you all to sit back, finish your sandwiches, enjoy them, and, and, and uh, enjoy what I know will be a very interesting panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wendy, and, and thank you very much to the Middle East Institute for hosting us today and for, for everyone for being here. We, we are very pleased when we can share a report in this manner and have a hopefully very engaging discussion on, on some of the issues that are coming up because this report, more, more jobs, better jobs, a priority for Egypt, as you say, Wendy, is very timely. We've all seen what's happened to Egypt in the last three years, and we know that, that every Everyone is still trying to deal with the ramification of, of, of the changes that are taking place. But if one thing is a recurrent thought, it is that thought, that, and one thing is a recurrent theme, it is the theme about jobs, about opportunities, especially for the young. And it is not just an Egyptian story, it is a story that resonates across the region. So it's very timely that we have this discussion here today, and we're very grateful for this. So what's new about this report? Well. What's interesting is that the team managed to gather data, um, very, very rich and quite detailed data that is um, covering a 15-year period. Um, so, so it's data-based in terms of mining. And all the more notable um, when we consider that in this region, data is difficult to come by, as you may know. Um, and so the report is fairly unique in that it brings this to bear and it undertakes this analysis on both sides of the labor market, uh, both the employees as well as the employers. So, so one begins to see that picture, and those of you who who've had a chance to look at the report would have seen that. And so the report really focuses on the challenges faced by workers as well as by the firms and documents the difficult and very deteriorating labor market that we're seeing. So there are two hard truths that the report offers up. Uh, one is that unemployment alone does not tell the whole story. Instead, jobs are getting increasingly informal and insecure, so there's something else at play here. And secondly, that jobs, and this is obvious, is central for poverty reduction. One can't do one without it. Uh, one can't do it without it. And so the worsening job quality and the worsening insecurity has very much accompanied the poverty story that we see unfolding. So what's new about this and how it was done? Well, we benefited, and we will hear from the lead author, Tara Vishnavath, on this, but we benefited from extensive consultations in Egypt. 
with a variety of stakeholders, non-state and non-traditional stakeholders. And just give you one little vignette of what one person said in a suit at a, at a, at a consultation, where young women and men expressed their deep, deep frustrations that they held. One young person said, only few people with connections can get good jobs. There's no value in a college degree if you live anywhere in Upper Egypt. Young people wait for a public sector job until they're 30, and then they're forced into a job without security. And that's kind of the story that we've heard over and over. Everyone here in this room, I'm sure, would have, would have heard this familiar story. So the story is really to challenge the status quo. There, the tensions at stake are, are real, and we're reminded of these by the stakeholders. It's how to navigate that urgency of protecting the poor and the vulnerable while working on the longer-term policy reforms that need to happen to enable the job market and the opportunities to open up. And so what have we found? We'll hear about it in much more detail. Well, even though there were some periods of relatively healthy GDP growth, obviously, employment situations have deteriorated. Formal jobs, uh, formal private sector jobs, that is, are few and far between, and particularly in Upper Egypt and in poor areas. And young Egyptians uh, are more educated than ever before, yet they are having that difficulty in finding jobs and they find menial or informal jobs and insecure jobs. So this is a very worrying trend, obviously, and when we see, especially on the gender dimension, women are more and more dropping out of the workforce. So a lot needs to be done. We need to work on the business environment, and the key message is clearly to help firms enter, to help firm, firms compete fairly, to help firms grow, and to expand employment opportunities to address these fundamental challenges. But also to deal with what is perceived and as unfair and a lot of uh, um, unwritten things that are happening in the business regulations. How are these regulations implemented de facto? Is it such that only insiders get the jobs, etc.? So that's on the, on the, on the supply side, if you, uh, on the demand side, if you like. And on the supply side, the education, education, education. Well, the education will need to overhaul to create the skills that the market actually needs. And this uh, obviously needs to go hand in hand with, with quality of jobs. So on the one hand, fixing and working on the business environment. On the other hand, working on the supply side. So the conclusion that we come to is that economic opportunities for Egyptians is obviously the surest path to, to the aspirations of the youth um, and to a society uh, to move forward in the manner that it deserves. And this is why we are particularly pleased to have this report before you today and to hear the views of, of our panelists. And so let me introduce our moderator, uh, Paul Danahar, who everyone will have known, will know of, I'm sure, the BBC's Bureau Chief for the Americas based here in Washington. We're delighted that Paul has agreed to moderate this. Paul has a long and distinguished career in broadcasting and was most recently the BBC's um, um, Middle East Bureau Chief from 2010 to 13. So an interesting time, I should say, to report from and on the Middle East. Um, and during this time, he won uh, an Emmy and a Peabody Award for the coverage uh, of the conflict in Syria. So we're just very privileged to have Paul amongst us today. Paul is also the author of the book, The New Middle East, The World After the Arab Spring, which I'm sure everyone will know of, and which is an excellent read, by the way, and which was published last year. So Paul, over to you. Wow, good afternoon. Uh, it's great to see such a big turnout, and I think that reflects the fact that we've all been watching Egypt kind of have a slow motion train crash uh, in the last few years. Um, and everyone's looking around for answers, and fundamental to those answers is how do we stop Egypt getting any worse. Um, fundamental to that is tackling one of the driving forces of the revolutions in 2011, which was about unemployment and the ever present fear of millions of middle class people that they will fall or stumble into poverty. When I was in Tahrir Square, as I was for the entire revolution and then uh, afterwards, bread, di bread, dignity and social justice was what everyone was shouting about. And jobs is pretty fundamental to all of that. If you don't have a job, you don't have a sense of dignity because you can't get married. If you can't get married, 
you can't have sex. If you can't have sex, you get pretty frustrated. You can't do drugs because drugs are illegal. And you can't walk down the street complaining because you get locked up. <laughs> So having a job is pretty important in the Middle East, and it defines, particularly amongst young men, how they feel about themselves and how they are placed within their family. And it affects women, too, who are really, really a driving force within the Arab Spring. And often when things are good, they get ignored, and when things are bad, they take on all the pressure. So it's a really important topic, and we've got some really great people. I'll introduce them shortly. Uh, first of all, I'll talk about our main speaker. That is Tara Vishwanath, who is... Where is she? She's over there. Um, she's a lead economist in the Poverty Global Practice of the World Bank. She is also the lead author of the report we are here to discuss, which is More Jobs, Better Jobs, a Priority for Egypt. Now, the, the, what we're going to do is she will talk for about 20 minutes to uh, give her findings and recommendations, and then she will join me and the other panelists over here to talk about what she's found out. And those panel members are... Uh, I'm going to keep this short because I kind of figure you can all read, otherwise you wouldn't be here. So you can find out what they do in kind of greater detail from the event you have in front of you on the program, but I'll keep it short. So Hisham Fermi, who has been serving as Executive Director, then CEO of the American Chamber of Commerce in Egypt since December 1999, which means he's seen all the bad stuff, so he knows what he's talking about. Uh, Hafez Ghanem, who is a Senior Fellow in the Global Economy and Development Program at the Brookings Institution, leading the Arab Economies Project, so will always have a job. And Anna Ravenga, who is the Senior Director of the Poverty Global Practice at the World Bank Group. And they've got lots of money, so you probably always have a job too. So first, let's kick off with Tara, who will uh, explain a massive report in 20 minutes. And uh, we'll go from there, Tara. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Thank you for coming to this brief overview of our new report focusing on the labor market in Egypt. It, as Inga said, it covers a 15-year period, uses multiple sources of data to examine both the employer and employee side of the market. We've consulted widely in Egypt, in Cairo, Upper Egypt, among the young, the old, the private sector firms, the government, and, and all sorts of people, and that's influenced some of our find, the way we've presented our findings. We won't be able to go into all the details that are there in the report, but I, therefore I strongly urge you to pick up a copy and read at your leisure. So let's begin with the big picture. Our main source of data provides a snapshot of Egypt at three years, 1998, 2006, and 2012. Those are your purple lines there, dotted purple lines. As you can see, the first two year survey years coincide with periods of relatively healthy GDP growth, while the last round covers the period immediately after the Arab Spring, the 25th, January 25th revolution, and that was accompanied by a severe economic crisis. However, deterioration in the labor market in Egypt is evident well before the crisis, and the declining job quality, we will show you, has been a staple feature of the labor market in Egypt. And that may have contributed to the dissatisfaction leading up to the Arab Spring. But since then, Egyptians have become far more negative about their economic prospects. Over 60% of the respondents to the recent uh, uh, Gallup poll say that the economy will, uh, will not improve for five years or more, and some actually say it'll never improve. That's over a 10% of Egyptians. So in this presentation, we will begin by describing the evolution of this labor market outcomes over this period, 15 years, and then show you that deterioration in job quality has been accompanied by increasing exclusion of groups of Egyptian and places in Egypt and try and, uh, from good jobs and try and answer why we see the outcomes that we do. And the re in the report, we detail a lot of important reforms that are needed to get Egypt back on track. However, this tumultuous transition period and the pressure on series of governments to deliver results quickly may pose challenges to undertake these kinds of reforms. So, despite the food and financial crisis and the Arab Spring, unemployment, in fact, has not increased in Egypt. It fell, as you can see, between 1998 and 2006, and has rem remarkably remained stable during the crisis years. However, 
informality has become a staple feature, as I said before, and more than half of the employed workers aged 15 to 64 are working in informal jobs. You can see that it has been rising, and, and, uh, and these are workers who ha don't have a contract of social insurance, so they're insecure. And this share, while it's been rising, but if you look down there, the, in recent, the crisis has driven uh, people into more insecure jobs. In other words, um, the irregular employment, which is casual or seasonal labor, now accounts for 17% of employment and a third of the informal jobs. Now, informality in Egypt is, is, is uh, not restricted to just informal firms. Infor f formal firms are those who have a license and are registered, right? Even in a formal firm, the odds of landing a job with no contract or insurance is about 50%, okay? No, not surprisingly, however, if you work for an informal job uh, firm, you are guaranteed an informal job. Okay? So what explains the deterioration in job quality? The main source of formal employment for the longest time in Egypt was the public sector. Egypt, but, was, but Egypt was one of the few countries in the region that actually limited public sector employment in the 90s, which ultimately froze in 2003. And that's reflected there, right? Because they, it fell, as a fraction of the labor force, it fell from 34% to 27%. Okay, you can see that um, on that on that on those graphs. Now, did the the, pri the private sector, the formal private sector, however, did not bridge this gap, right? Instead, what we see is formal informal sector is growing, and it's 40% of the labor force in 2012, whereas the private formal sector remains stagnant across the three years at 13%. Now, why did this formal sector not uh, formal private sector not pick up the slack, right? On the face of it, on the right-hand side, what you see is rates of firm entry into, into the formal private sector is very, very low. Only one firm per 100,000 population is actually entering this formal private sector, and that is far, it's about a tenth of the low rates in the MENA region, and it's much smaller than an 80 country average of 24 per 100,000 population, okay? So as a result, employment is very concentrated in small young firms of less than four people, which are most likely informal firms. And these account for 40% of the private sector jobs in Egypt. That's your long thing there, which says 39%, the, the leftmost bar, bar on the graph. Moreover, these firms also do not grow over time. There are very few mid-aged, mid-sized firms barely accounting for about 7% of employment. And this is in contrast to a country like Egypt, a um, country like Turkey, you know, which is, which actually as the firms grow mid and become mid-sized and mid-aged, they actually absorb 17%. They, they account for 17% of employment. So the panel on the right actually illustrates it. It shows you employment growth in Egypt and Turkey as firms age. If each of the firms aged zero to four years are normalized, let's say, to have one employee. In Egypt, you can see that as firms age, they rarely even double. Whereas in Turkey, as firms uh, grow a bit older, they, are, they do double, and as they grow even older and larger, they rapidly expand employment. So this sort of natural dynamic where firms are born, grow, and expand employment seems to be terribly stalled in Egypt, right? So let's ask why. Low rates of firm entry and slow pace of firm growth are the natural outgrowth of Egypt's approach to regulation. It inhibits free entry and exit by stigmatizing and criminalizing bankruptcy. There is also too much red tape that makes it harder to set up a business, grow it, take risks, innovate. Even when regulations look good on paper, as our business uh, you know, surveys show, they are actually enforced inconsistently. There is real consequences to this. About 80% of firms who were surveyed in 2008 indicate that policy implementation uncertainty is the biggest obstacle to their growth. In fact, in sectors where this is implemented more predictably and consistently, you see growth. 
Okay, so, so the, 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 the problem with this kind of a regulatory burden is serious. Okay, then regulations may also be enforced more strictly on some firms than on others, rigging the game in favor of existing firms. Finally, as in some other MENA countries, firms that are connected to parties in power or to those who are holding official posts enjoy a number of advantages compared to unconnected firms. In short, private sector firms in Egypt are simply not competing on a level playing field. So resources get diverted away from the most productive firms, that's misallocation. Potential entrepreneurs are discouraged from entering, unproductive firms are discouraged from leaving, and as a result, you have very little private sector job growth. Now, uh, we, we can also illustrate here to you what are the privileges that connected firms enjoy. Connected firms enjoy disproportionate access to credit, capital, land, and to certain lucrative sectors. So for instance, if you look among large firms in Egypt, these connected firms dominate credit, the credit market but account for very few jobs. Egypt's industrial energy subsidy also disproportionately favors these connected firms. Few unconnected firms make it to energy intensive industries like cement and steel. Industries with more politically connected firms are more likely to have industrial zone, access to industrial zones with better infrastructure, tax breaks, and these firms are also protected by non-tariff barriers. These privileges not only stifle competition, but they also encourage connected firms to use more capital and less labor. And that's indeed evident when you look at why growth did not translate to jobs. Now, these few and far between formal private sector jobs are also unevenly distributed across space. The map on the left tells you the survey coverage, right? But our, what our survey covered. Basically, it covers areas that are metropolitan areas in and around uh, areas surrounding Cairo, Port, uh, Port Said, Suez, and Alexandria. Okay, and that is home to a quarter of the population. Lower Egypt, the most populous region, is to the north of Cairo, and Upper Egypt is to the south of Cairo. But while every country has a natural economic geography and a tendency for jobs to be in urban areas, in Egypt, this contrast between metropolitan areas and, and the rest is quite stark. We can see that in the right, right? We, we see that jobs, jobs are, if you look at formal private sector job, an overwhelming number of them are in metropolitan areas, they're heavily concentrated. Over half, half of Egypt's formal private sector jobs are located there, but then as contrast, you look at upper Egypt, it hardly has a meaningful formal private sector, and even the public sector is disproportionately small. These characteristics of the Egyptian labor market are dominant but shrinking public sector, a stagnant private sector with riddled with informality and concentrated in metropolitan areas has meant that groups of Egyptians have been rendered unable to meaningfully participate. Broadly, there are three excluded groups. Those living further away from the metropolitan areas, younger Egyptians, and women. And, and the labor market has affected these three groups very differently. Let's look, at the, let's look at the first. The concentration of formal private sector in metropolitan Egypt means that residents in this region have substantially easier time finding good jobs. Over half of the labor force participants, the, the, the red line to the left there, if you can see 1998, um, over the three years, they, ha they basically have better, uh, they have about uh, 38, I mean, over 50% of people in public or formal private sector jobs. Compared to 38%, it reduces in lower Egypt and further reduces to 30% in upper Egypt. But note that over time, this has been secularly declining everywhere. Formal jobs are declining everywhere. There is, so, there is also a large and persistent wage premium for being in the metropolitan areas. That's to your right. Okay? And it's linked to their access to formal private sector jobs. On the face of it, if you have these persistent wage gaps, it reflects immobility of firms and workers, right? On the worker side, you see in Egypt has the lowest rates of migration, especially long distance migration. Now, commuting is very common, right? They, 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 many people commute from surrounding the metro areas, surrounding the metropolitan areas to access jobs. But, they, they, but congestion in these areas is making it very 
very time consuming even to make it in short distances, disconnecting access to jobs. Now, the unemployment has, as a matter of course, been heavily concentrated among the youth. In 1998, men aged 20 to 24 experienced an unemployment rate of 20%. But for men, you can see uh, by the time they hit age 30, it drops to as low as 3%, right? And this shape has been preserved over time. But in, if you look at 2006 and 2012, that you see that unemployment has dropped. Right? It has dropped to 12%. That's not, that's not small. And it's also accompanied with protracted periods of unemployment and, jobs, uh, and job search. You know, insertion into the labor market is very difficult. Now, on the right-hand side, what I'm going to show, show you is that the formal employment rate also increases with age. So this is 1998. So you see that formality rates increase steadily as men grow older, and especially about, uh, you know, after the age of 30, it continues to rise till retirement, right? But over time, 2006, 2012, the blue and the, it's preserved its shape but shifted to the right, right? So what that means is employ, formal employment has declined for every single age group. And while age still increases chances of transitioning to a formal sector job, this transition is less and less likely. So my, the sons are doing far worse than their fathers, even though they're on average more educated. So let's look at how high school educated Egyptians, born in mid to late 50s, these are all age cohorts, okay, were doing when they were 20 years old. 45% of them had found a formal sector job. Now let's compare that to Egyptians born 30 years later, to mid to late 90s, right, who were 20 years old about five years ago. Their prospects are, have dropped. Only 13% are getting formal sector jobs. The, the prospects for college graduates has also deteriorated, especially for those born after 1960. So education is no longer bringing the benefits that it used to. So you may wonder why they would want to invest in education. Now for women, the third excluded group, Especially educated women, the decline in formal employment in the public sector just means dropping out of the labor force. Of women with high school degree who were born in mid to late 50s, just, just similar to the previous slide, half were working or looking for work. So 50% were participating in the labor market. But again, 30 years later, only one in 10 are doing so, and that's a very staggering decline. Again, they're getting more educated. College-educated women, similarly, have followed a similar pattern through their youth. So now, you may ask, for women especially, faced with declining jobs in the public sector, why don't they turn to the formal private sector for work? At the moment, only 2% of working age women are in the formal private sector. Why is that? In our data, we find that they are willing to, but are faced with the prospects of receiving much lower wages relative to men and relative to the public sector. Right? So for example, women with post-secondary education, the farthest sort of bar graphs, right? you see that they earn 22% less than men in the public sector, but 33% less than men in the private sector. And that's a big deterrent. Moreover, conservative social norms and concerns about safety and harassment imply that women face significant barriers to mobility. In addition, the high concentration of employment in metropolitan Egypt is a bigger problem for women than for men because women are much less likely to commute and especially married women have dual responsibilities at home and work, which is a worldwide problem. So all of this is happening, all of this is happening at a time when demographics have in fact been in Egypt's favor. Currently, there are about 15 million Egyptians in their 20s. Over the next decade, this is gradually reducing a bit to 14 million, which should further reduce the demographic pressure. But an unusual hike in fertility rates have created another youth bulge that is nearly 50% larger. You see See that 20 million people, they are going to enter in 15 to 20 years' time, 
Okay? So if the labor market conditions don't improve by the time this generation starts entering the labor force, there will be severe problems with unemployment and the quality of employment will deteriorate even further. So the only way this can be addressed if there's a vibrant private sector in place by the time they start looking for jobs. This means that if the government starts the process of reform now, it may be able to avert that crisis. However, what's the answer? Should we push firms to become formal firms? No, that's not a good path, because in the end, firms naturally choose when to formalize depending on the benefits. So what should the government do? We believe that the government can promote growth in the private sector by leveling the playing field. What does that mean? The process of removing entrenched policies and creating regulations that work on the ground and not just on paper may be politically difficult, but it will go a long way to towards building credibility and reducing the perception of unfairness among firms, and that may bring larger, more productive firms out of the shadows of informality. And here are some examples of what this could mean in practice. This is basically, you need an independent competition authority, not on paper, but ensure that it's fairly implemented across the wide swath of firms that are entering, helping them grow. You need to promote accountability and efficiency in the public sector. It should not be where, it should enable, and not be where the private sector should be producing, right? In the, in the, in the, in the, in the market. And you need to ease a lot of red tape, licensing proce procedures, bankruptcy, liquidation, and that promotes innovation. You need to incentivize entrepreneurship, but make sure that they have fair access to land, labor, and capital, otherwise they will never grow. And at the same time, education reform is a must, so private sector gets the skills they need. Now, there is always an imperative, something, to do anything in the short run, understandably. However, the government needs to resist overly populist measures that may backfire. Recently, in, as a part of the stimulus, package, minimum wages in Egypt for the public sector employees nearly doubled, and there is discussion of extending it to the private sector. Now this could, in the face of such a labor market, this could have dramatic ne negative effects on job quality because what will they do? They may either hire more informal workers to avoid legislation or stop hiring or in the extreme case just shut down because they can't compete. So and now expanding public employment may also be a tempting option, but this may make the private sector even less competitive and will be financially un uh, unsustainable, especially when the next youth bulge arrives. But there are certain things in the short run that actually could work and bear fruit later on. For example, public investment, public works that are spatially targeted can build impo uh, bridge important infrastructure gaps in various areas. For example, child mortality in rural upper Egypt is very high and better rural health infrastructure may be very helpful. Another example is closer to metropolitan areas, improved transportation infrastructure. That can help better connect Egyptians to jobs. There are many, many such examples. Now, but our work in other countries actually shows that programs like wage subsidy, training, placement, actually eventually in the long run have little impact in the context of a dysfunctional private sector. Band-aids fall off eventually, and there is no substitute for fundamental private sector reform. So the the surest way to help Egyptian workers is to help Egyptian firms flourish and grow. And finally, taking a broader perspective, strengthening the links between labor market and welfare where individuals feel like they have access to quality economic opportunities is the most sustainable way for social stability and for building a more inclusive Egypt. It'll go a long way in fulfilling the aspirations that came to the fore during the Arab Spring. Thank you very much. The Egyptian government doesn't listen to anybody. <laughs> are they going to listen to the World Bank? And if they do, what are they going to implement into this and how are they going to change things? Yeah, actually, actually uh, they, 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 they have to change things because as Tara said, uh, there, is, uh, the, there is this demand 
for change and in terms of creating more jobs, creating more opportunities, uh, and particularly for young, for young people. Now, the, the problem, is, as, as I see it, is that they need to show results quickly. And, and most of those uh, uh, reforms, I mean, what, what Tara is recommending in, in, uh, in, in that book, uh, things like leveling the playing field, being more, uh, uh, more transparent, and, and so on and so forth, uh, are all like motherhood and apple pie, that people will not say we don't want to do it. They will say we want to do it, and actually they will probably pass laws and regulations to do it. And they have done that in the past. And that, that is why e e Egypt's core or the doing business reports improved so, on paper. so, so much on paper uh, due, uh, 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 over the last 10 years or so. Now, the issue is implementation. I think that there are two problems and, and two issues that we need to look at. One is implementation. Uh, and, and there, what I, I think what we, what we need to think about is uh, how can we get more people involved in actually designing and implementing those programs. Listen, this is what the Indonesians did after the fall of Suharto. The, uh, they did not have budgets to carry out all kinds of uh, difficult reforms, well, but they decentralized quick, quickly. They built public-private uh, partnerships and partnerships with civil society to deal with issues like corruption uh, uh, and, and so on and so forth. This is also what the Brazilians did. Uh, when President Lula came to power in Brazil and, and, and he wanted to implement a zero hunger program, uh, he created CONSEA, which is uh, a, a, a partnership between civil society, private sector, and government. Uh, the, obje the objective really is to make those kinds of reforms stick, to make them implementable. Now, we did a lot of uh, uh, analysis, which gives very, uh, very similar results to uh, what Tara was saying. We did analysis for small firms, for example, mm -hmm. before and after the uh, reforms, the simplification of the registration processes, reforms, and so on. And uh, we went and asked those firms before and after, uh, uh, have things, and we found that there is, has been no change whatsoever. So uh, I, as a, as, as a firm, uh, I, I hear that registration has become simpler, so I go and try to register. But it does. That is, it is the exact same uh, story as before. And th there are two explanations, possible explanations for that. One is that the uh, institution uh, that is responsible for implementation is so weak and that actually the information never passes down. So people don't know, people are supposed to implement, actually are not aware of the change in regulations. The other explanation is that those people are corrupt. And if you simplify, th they have less possibilities for corruption and, and, and rent seeking. And therefore, th they, they did not simplify. Now, if you set up a, 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 a process or an institution whereby those small firms, those young entrepreneurs, can actually uh, have a voice, can actually go to government and inform them, and, and have have a way of sitting together with the government regularly and inform them of those kinds of problems and holding those people accountable. Let me let me stop you there, Hisham. You have to deal with the people that turn the theory into money, and and and. Uh, uh, and employ people, how do they change the private sector environment so that it works? And you brought that along for comfort or to make it more <laughs> I'm not that bad at moderating. Comfort, grab it, So tell me, how do we make jobs in the private sector that actually A, are jobs, and B, are good jobs that people want? Because the thing about Egypt is, Everybody wants a government job because it's a job mm -hmm. for life. I mean, I used to go into government offices at 10 in the morning and then come back at 1 o'clock when people actually turned up. Um, so how do you make the private sector work better than, the, than, the, than the, the, the public sector? And how do you make good jobs? Uh, well, thank you, Paul. I just want to uh, start by saying I'm, a, I, I'm an optimist. And everybody who knows me knows I've been an optimist even in our darkest times. Um, and and you, you talked about Egypt going in a train crash. Um, I'm still an optimist, and I look around the region, and I think Egypt's like the silver line, quite honestly, <laughs> compared to everything that's going on. That's true. So uh, uh, let's, let's, let's begin from there, I think. Uh, uh, and uh, I... It's uh, slow motion. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fine. <laughs> 
<laughs> Lots of stops. <laughs> uh, and I'd like to thank Dara for the for an incredible uh, piece of work on 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 the data and so on. And all of it really does reflect uh, what is what has been happening. And I think your recommendations about how to make the private sector employ more people is exactly what the private sector wants. Um, it's all these uh, issues about making regulations simpler, making regulations uh, easier, how to, how to get small companies to, to, to really get into uh, what they want to do without worrying about the bureaucracy, about the corruption, what about, uh, and so on. Uh, and I think there have been quite a few uh, examples that in Egypt that have been happening very recently. You, and you just look at entrepreneurship in Egypt since the revolution. It sprung up like crazy. Most of it, most of it is in the IT business for one reason. They don't have to deal with the government. Yeah. It's just in the cloud. Uh, but there are also really some good uh, examples of people just doing a lot of uh, entrepreneurship work and, and growing. And there have been some some companies that have started small and growing. Mm -hmm. I worry about, about the, the example of Turkey, about the, the, the age of the companies going uh, larger, because I think it relates to the economic performance of Turkey, rather than just that the firms have the, the experience. I, I, we need to look at that. Mm -hmm. um, also, maybe I disagree with you about bringing people into the metropolitan areas to get good jobs. I think the jobs should go out to the to, to outside of the metropolitan area, not bring people more in, because that's going to be more informality, more informal uh, slums areas. Uh, there's nowhere to put these people. I mean, Cairo is what 17 million and grows to 22 million during the day. We can hardly work. You know, when we hire at Amgen people, we look at where they live. And if they're women, and I have 80% women, I'm proud to say, in, in, in the AmCham, we make sure that they're living within the vicinity uh, and so on. But there are fantastic examples about uh, franchising. We never talked about franchising, entrepreneurship, but micro lending. I think there are fantastic examples in Egypt about micro lending. And how can we expand those that? really give opportunity to, to, the, uh, to the less privileged. But, but let me ask you a good question there. I don't doubt that 10 years ago you could have said the same things you're saying now. There are lots of good opportunities, there are lots of uh, examples of things that are working really well, blah, 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 blah. And 10 years on, we are still where we are. How do we actually really make a difference in Egypt? Because there are sort of seeds that are budding, but they don't seem to bloom. And if they do, they get cut off by somebody. But I think you need to expand on, on those seeds, help them uh, multiply and enlarge. But I think I agree with what needs to be done, that the government needs to take a lot of, uh, a lot of the flack on how to get women, uh, how to subsidize the maternal leave, how to, I mean, internships, uh, uh, mentoring, all these things need the support of the government. Transparency, I think, is a very important word that cuts across the bureaucracy, it cuts across the uh, corruption, it cuts across tender, tender law, it cuts across how to get land and so on. I also disagree that the large companies get all the funding because all the banks have a loan to, uh, uh, loan to deposit ratio of 50%. So there's lots of money floating around in the Egyptian banks that are not being given out to the SMEs because they don't know how and they, they, they don't have the guarantees for SMEs or the informal sector to access that finance. Can I I'm just ask, stop. Anna, um, where can we look at in history and other parts of the world where we can all agree that, India, that uh, Egypt can learn lessons? So let me start by saying that um, from a diagnostic point of view, Egypt to me isn't so unique. I mean, the picture that Tara portrays, we've seen in many other places. Um, I think, uh, I'm thinking of my home country, Spain, which has mm -hmm. some, through its evolution, has shared some similarities. I think one thing that is different about Egypt is the demographics. I actually think the demographics are a plus and not a minus, and I can come back to that. Um, I think uh, there are countries that have successfully tackled what we would call the jobs challenge. And I'm not going to go talk about East Asia, because I think East Asia has very easy dynamics. but. Um, if we stay within the vicinity, you know, you can think of the way that 
well, even you could even go to a rich country like Germany, the way that it, it tackled the problems in its labor market following reunification. Or you can think about Poland, the way that actually Poland has dealt with economic reforms and the success it's had. Um, you could think about, to some extent, Turkey. I mean, I wrote a, a labor study in Turkey 16 years ago that said that there are a lot of things wrong with Turkey's labor market. It actually has had pretty pretty impressive performance in the last 10 years. And so I think there are some lessons. It is possible to put in place a strategy um, that stimulates job creation. And I think there's some lessons about the type of reforms that it takes. Um, I think, uh, and I want to say a few things about those, but I think what these countries did have in common, and this is, I think, what makes Egypt perhaps more difficult, and I don't know Egypt very well, is in addition to the economic reforms, you need a parallel process of the modernization of institutions. Um, and that's a political process. And so a country like Poland had something it was aspiring to, which was the EU. Spain had something it was aspiring to, which was the EU, which forced a modernization of its institutions that allow things like transparency and accountability to be um, brought in. Now, the other thing I would say is no country, there's no sort of easy solution or silver bullet. These are not, it requires doing a set of reforms that are politically difficult, that touch on vested interests, and you do need some kind of um, political coalition or a coalition of people who want that change for it to, to happen. I tend to agree with very much the diagnostics that it's about a dynamic private sector at the heart of it. Um, you really you really do need that. And it's about, and most of the times, the problems in the labor market are not in the labor market, but outside it. Non-competitive product markets, uh, inadequate uh, non-competitive service markets, inadequate infrastructure, a financial sector that allocates money to the connected and not to small growing firms. Um, and some things are in the labor market, sort of uh, de facto dual labor markets that arise because the institutions and the regulations protect a small group of workers at the expense of others. This is very much the Spanish story. <laughs> very much basically condemns young people to second class, uh, low quality jobs. But these things actually can be reformed. So I would say if you, if you want to pick four key ingredients is you need to make sure that the, the private sector has room to grow. And that does mean leveling the playing field. It also means, and I think, you know, again, going back to Poland, it's a very interesting example of how a country took uh, an economy that wasn't a market economy, uh, did a lot of reforms to make a, a much more competitive environment. That's where Poland succeeds, and perhaps the Ukraine does not, is it actually has competition in product markets. It has credible regulatory authorities. <laughs> it reformed its energy subsidies. So it did a whole host of things, helped by the fact that it had a benchmark that it was aiming to achieve, which was... European quality institutions, and that allowed it to do to really generate um, very good employment performance. But it took them about ten years. So the reforms were done in the '90s, and they really start to pay off ten years later. When you are see, we, are we too impatient with the Middle East? Well, I think we are because it it does take you know every successful country we've looked at it takes it takes five to ten years for that those reforms to pay off, and often they first pay off in productivity growth, so people aren't seeing the jobs. It's just that some of the jobs are getting better. And then eventually, and this is the polling case, you see both the growth in the number of jobs and the quality of the jobs. Let me, let me you're talking about how long it takes. There's a, there's a line in your report, Tar, which I'd like to, to quote, because it's a great one. And it says, over the last 60 years, economic policies in Egypt have not been aimed primarily at economic and jobs growth. Which makes you think, what have they been doing for the last 60 years? Because they're not trying to use their economy to grow the economy and, and grow jobs. What have they been up to? Well, <laughs> as we illustrate in the report, uh, we, uh, we back that statement up by showing you that, you know, th you know 2004 to 910 was actually a period of rapid growth. Okay, so the first thing we tackle is okay, that was growing, so what happened to jobs, right? And you see exactly over that same period this deterioration, right? So, what has happened in short is that the sectors that grew were not really producing good jobs you know they were they were mining uh, some so I'm forgetting the list but it was real estate you know finance these were the sectors and and they weren't really growing and so you know, I mean it did so that's the sort of a rationale for us saying that saying what we did in terms of you know needing these sorts of reforms now I want to turn to 
you and say, I think I agree with a lot of things you're saying. In fact, I think that reforms that need to level the playing field in, in many instances I've said that, you know, in the end, it's political will. You know, every government knows you need to do this, right? But I think there's a lot of difficulty with vested interest, resisting reform. So those sorts of, but you can take small steps. We think of it more as a medium term. Uh, and you want to, uh, the problem we have is if you don't start doing this now, just incentivizing entrepreneurship, right, is not going to help, right? Because let's say you give them credit, right? But if they don't have e easy access to other things, they're not going to grow. I mean, in the US, the most important thing, I just want to contrast because the data is rich and the researchers who do it are fantastic because they have data. What do they show in, e in US? They show you that there's enormous entry. Startups are the name of the game. They produce jobs. But you can't predict, right? They, they, but they're also failing in large large numbers, you couldn't uh, predict an apple, you couldn't predict Starbucks, but the moral of the story is don't pick your winners, don't take jobs somewhere else and, uh, you know, start picking winners and build, in, you know, <coughs> industries there, but spread jobs through an enabling policy environment. This is infrastructure, all the things you said, but they need to do that. But if you, I mean, I, I remember sitting with a businessman in the Middle East and uh, he had a big pile of papers on his desk and he said to me, look, this is what corruption means. Any one of these papers could be used to put me in jail because I cannot run my business legally because it just doesn't work. So my question, I mean, Hef, is how, how do we get to a stage where corruption is not only part of the system, it is a system because it's often used in countries yeah. as a kind of form of entrapment. You know, you make everybody have to do everything illegally and then when you want to go after yeah. them, you go after them for being corrupt, not for a political reason or whatever. How do we break that cycle? Well, first, as Anna said, I think, uh, which is very important, is that uh, this, those problems are not specific to Egypt. And uh, this corruption problem is certainly not specific to Egypt. And we worked in many countries uh, where there is even more, more corruption than, than that. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel. There are solutions to fighting corruption that have worked in, in, in other places. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure I'm 100% in agreement with Tara when she says it is political will. This is, it's, 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 it's too easy to tell them, it's your fault, you don't have the political will to reform. It's actually a problem with the institutions. You need to renew and, and restructure those institutions. And institutional renewal and restructuring is a very difficult and time-consuming time process. Now, back to your question on, 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 on corruption specifically. Uh, one of uh, my colleagues at, uh, who was former colleague at the bank and former uh, uh, colleague at, 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 Bro at Brookings, uh, uh, Danny Kaufman, who is an expert on corruption, <laughs> always t says that you do not fight corruption by fighting corruption. That is, you do not fight corruption by running around and putting people in jail because they are corrupt. Actually, uh, uh, we, I worked in, in, in countries who, uh, who shall not be named where uh, you, you actually use this uh, to put your political opponents in jail rather than uh, actually cleaning up uh, the system. So you don't want to do that. What, what you want to do is, is to put in place a system where you force transparency, where you force accountability. And, and, and that happens wow. by building a civil society, uh, by, 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 by building uh, uh, the, the press, the media, uh, uh, to, f to force really? uh, tr tr uh, transparency, by giving people voice so that if I am harassed by, uh, by the police in the middle of the night asking me to pay, uh, to, uh, to pay a bribe, I can go uh, and complain. And actually, this policeman who who made me pay the bribe is is held accountable. We saw that briefly after 2011, and then the young people just gave up getting involved in politics mm -hmm. and left back to the two usual forces, the Brotherhood and the Egyptian Army. So how do we get them involved? I mean, they they weren't interested, and they they had a revolution. They went home. They moaned a lot. They didn't get involved in the politics at all. So how do you change that civil society? Uh, uh, I, I I I think uh, uh, well. Uh, changing this, uh, the, uh, I, I think there's a lot, and I go back to what Hisham is saying, there is a lot of energy in, yes. in, in, among the young people in Egypt. Uh, and you saw that when you spent all those weeks at Tahrir Square. There is, a, there is a lot of energy, there's a big desire to, to, do, to do things, uh, but uh, they have not 
be encouraged. Like it is very difficult to start uh, a civil uh, an NGO in, in Egypt. It, mm, it is very difficult to get funding for that NGO right. in Egypt. Uh, I, I think that what we need to do now is try to encourage those young Egyptians to mm. actually wor work uh, uh, in those areas to start an NGO to fight corruptions, uh, a, a kind of uh, local transparency international. Uh, there are many many possibilities for things to do. We compared uh, and Brooks did a little study uh, comparing the uh, because you're absolutely right the percentage I mean the civil society and NGO or sector can become an important employer uh, I think that I'm not sure that my numbers are correct uh, but uh, uh, we looked at uh, we compared the Netherlands with with Egypt and you had like nine percent uh, of the workforce in the Netherlands is, is involved in NGOs and civil society type activities whereas in Egypt it's less than two percent so let me answer some question. I mean, unlike the World Bank, young people in Egypt are not going to hang around 10 years to see something change. The World Bank is saying, if we do this, we'll get to the right place eventually. The, the young people in Dyer Square are saying, I want it now. So what can be done now to make sure that the youth bulge that you talked about 15 years from now isn't the next revolution, or maybe the 20th revolution between now and then, because we keep having revolutions every couple of years. How are you going to make the young people that are in your country get involved, and how are you going to get private enterprise to give them jobs that they feel they have some investment in in, in Egypt? Because at the moment, the, the thing I found is that young people just think, we had a revolution, nothing changed, nothing got better. How do you make them feel there's something worth, worth hoping for? I, I think there are, there are several steps to be taken immediately. Okay. Uh, and, and the first step is getting as many people into jobs as possible. Uh, and. And jobs, I mean, you know, there are good jobs and bad jobs, but there are jobs. You, you don't want people sitting around the cafes and, 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 and moaning and doing nothing. Uh, and I think the first thing that you should do is, the, uh, maybe that's what the government's looking at now, is infrastructure jobs, which hires a lot of people. That's midterm. I mean, that's not going to be, you know, you know how many roads you're going to build, how many bridges you're going to build, uh, and so on. But I think these are things that have to be done immediately. I think we have to go back to education. We have to go back. I, I know this is not going to help people who already graduated, but the skills gap uh, at Amcham, we have an online recruitment system. We have, I think last time I looked, we had 42,000 CVs on our website, and we already have 2,500 job openings that are not being filled. So how come you can't fill 2,500 jobs when you have 42,000 people with CVs on what's, your what's, what's the answer to that question? And, and the answer is either on job training for those now, uh, on job training, mentorship, um, subsidy for temporary work that, that, you, that you've suggested, um, but also trying to change the curricula in, in schools, in uh, get the get industry involved in the curriculum, get, uh, get organizations like uh, Education for Employment that uh, take people and teach them the soft skills, teach them the, the technical skills if you want bankers or you want uh, ca cashiers and so on, train them and then they will be immediately employed. I think we really need to increase all the support uh, systems for that. And Anna, in the revolutions and the changes that you've looked at, do you have to just kind of write off a generation and look towards the next one? Or can you change the generation that you've got and help them adapt quickly into the new environment that's been created by the, up, the, the uprising or the economic change? Let me, I think, connect it to what Hisham was saying. I mean, I'm, I'm always a little bit suspicious when the answer to uh, a job problem is investment in skills. Uh, it's an important component, but no investment in skills will make up for the lack of competitive markets, mm -hmm. transparent institutions, and a mm -hmm. dynamic private sector. Uh, governments like to invest in skills because it makes them, it allows them to say, well, I'm doing something, I'm investing in training. But in fact, it doesn't actually do much if the other elements are not in place. So it's a, it's a temptation to say, oh, we'll just do a lot of training. And you know, you can go back and see what Tunisia was doing a few years ago. It was doing these big investments mm -hmm. in training, but it wasn't tackling the structural issues. And uh, so there is a skill mismatch. And I do think there are intelligent ways to tackle that, that mismatch. And I, I think what we find, uh, and again, it's worldwide, is that 
um, the demand, the type of skills that are needed in job now are a little bit different than they used to be. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, yes, it's important to have, you know, in some cases you need some manual skills, but increasingly there's some routine cognitive skills, there's some what we call new economy skills, a lot of soft skills um, that, that are part of the package. So there are opportunities through training, on the job training and other types of interventions to package uh, what is technical skills with these, not, these uh, soft skills, teamwork. Uh, conflict resolution. And, and when you interview employers, they tend to say that what kids are lacking when they're coming out of school are some of these soft skills. Uh, so they are interventions. I think they're very interesting interventions even in this country at the state level. I was very interested in you know, learning about a program in Kentucky of all places I wouldn't have you know, occurred to me. But essentially what they do is local governments are brokering an, an association between employers, big employers in the, in mm -hmm. the state. Yeah. Um, in the state of Kentucky, which is, you know, there's health sector and logistics and the, and the universities, particularly the, in the community level colleges in the US because that's sort of the entry level. And they are creating the right curricula. The, the, the employers are committing to taking the kids in the summer uh, or taking them at the end of their careers. But they're doing it in a way that's stackable credentials. This comes to your point. So you can go and you do a short course and you get a set of skills. You go work. You come back maybe a year later, two years later, and you get a credential that stacks on the previous one. So you can go, you know, you can learn how to be a pitchfork operator and then you can come back and learn something slightly more sophisticated about logistics. This allows you to work You've got to get kids through high school, but that this allows you to work with people throughout their lives. So it's it's much more of a continuous access to training. So you don't just you know put them through the system, put them out there, it's done. You actually create a system that allows them to go back, get reskilled, come back. Requires very little public money because of the, there's no public financing. What the, the the local governments are doing are facilitating that, bringing together. What are public universities and employers? One of the things about Egypt that's different from many other places in the world is um, we used to have a situation where you know, people talk about poacher becoming gamekeeper. And in Egypt, we've got the army, which is now both poacher and gamekeeper. And I noticed in your report, which I think is about 396 pages long, the word army appears twice. Yes, so the, that's a good point. So, so you'll get a chance. Yeah. So, <laughs> my question to you is, you know, we've got the army, which is seen to, and no one knows how big the army is in the economy. I mean, some people say 5%, 30%, and you can't ask the army without getting locked up if you ask them too much. So the question is, what role does the army as an economic factor play in this? And what difference does it make that, you know, they're supposed to be overseeing a reform of an economic model that doesn't work for them because they want to have all their privileges? How, do you, how are they going to square that circle, or are they not going to? And we're all going to look kind of to the left a little bit and focus on the bits that don't involve the army. How do we deal with the army? <laughs> Why did you ask me that question? <laughs> <laughs> so when I went on consultation in Egypt, it was the most interesting thing that happened was we discussed all our data. We don't have data on the army. I've looked. I don't have data that I can analyze like I've done. So so one of the people was sitting quiet there, a private sector person, who after everybody spoke, he said, Madam, you haven't you need to tackle Egypt's army. And I was like, no, how do I do that? This is, and he was sort of describing the presence of this in, so he said, you can talk about connected funds, but you're not talking about this big part of government that is in the economy. So the army is eating the private sector's lunch. <laughs> yeah, he, to quote. They're also it. making it, because they make olive oil, and they make bread, and everything. So, so they're making and eating at the same time, which is poached and gay people. But see, that's a huge, I mean, if, um, I don't know, but if I were to read the Egyptian papers over the last two, three weeks, that's a little bit of a fear, because it's, it seems to be getting pre more present, right? And that's something that I think is go not going to help with the rest of it, right? Because if you're not, I mean, the same story, if you're not, if the government is very much in there with the army and procurement reforms are not happening or happening only to suit procurement, they may be doing this because they believe, and maybe they're right, that they can build this infrastructure quicker, they can get things done. But I think the, the actual way it sort of stifles whatever I was talking about is gonna be even more 
egregious. So, Hefes, let me ask you, I mean, people, I've spent a long time in India, and people used to say that India did, works despite its government. Is that what Egypt needs to do? Does it need to work despite the, the government, despite no. the army, just get on with it? Actually, uh, it already is working <laughs> despite does. the government. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I worked uh, uh, in the European transition countries in the 90s. And, and then I, I, came to, I, and I came to Egypt uh, uh, to, to look at what is happening in 2011, in February 2011, uh, right uh, after the revolution or even in the middle of it. And uh, everybody in Egypt was complaining about the, the decline in uh, GDP, the rise in unemployment and so on. And they continue complaining until today. Uh, however, if you compare the fall in employment, the fall in GDP in Egypt, for example, with, I don't know, Armenia or Georgia or even Poland, it is nothing in comparison. I mean, there was really no fall in, G in, in, in G decline in GDP. There was a decline in the rate of growth of GDP. Whereas w we worked in countries where that lost one third of their GDP overnight. So uh, why? Why is it that, uh, that we did not see such a huge shock? Although the revolution in Egypt took yeah. a, lo a long time and it was a bit, it is because, uh, as, as you rightly pointed out, as in India, the, uh, the, uh, the Egyptian economy functions despite of its army. Informality is ha ha has many positive aspects. And there's a part of the economy that actually Tara did not uh, uh, dwell on too much in her book, which I think is important, uh, which is the rural economy and agriculture. Re remember, one third of the, uh, of the labor force is in agriculture. Uh, and, and, and those are small family farmers. 98% of agriculture in Egypt is small family farms. And the average size of the farm is 0 0.7 hectares. And they are one of the most, they have some of the highest yields in the world. Oh, okay. uh, 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 and this is completely beyond the reach of all of those regulations as, uh, 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 as, and so on. Uh, I mean, we need to, to see how we can link them better to markets. We need to see how we can increase the value addition from agriculture, how, can we, how we can create uh, industries and agro-processing industries uh, and, and create former jobs in those, uh, 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 in those areas. But the, the fact of the matter is that the economy of Egypt is, is, is very diversified and the fact that we have this huge informal sector, we, ha we have this very, a, lo a huge entrepreneurial spirit uh, which, allow, uh, which, which allowed the, uh, the country to survive in spite of all those problems and which allowed it to survive uh, during, uh, through a long and complicated and messy political transition process uh, 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 without having those huge losses in income and employment that other countries uh, have, have, have uh, lived through. Yes, Chisholm, let me ask you, is it, let me ask you two questions and they're, and they're linked. Is it possible to be a businessman in Egypt and not be corrupt? <laughs> and does it matter? Yes. Does, it, does it matter whether there is some corruption in the system? Can it function with a certain level of corruption that means get on with it? It's like paying a tax; it's just an informal tax. I mean, first question without incriminating yourself. Second question without <laughs> incriminating the entire country. <laughs> Depends what you mean by corruption. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think absolutely. I, you know, I, and can I have the names of the people that have managed it? Because that should be in your next. No, book. I think you should. I think you should look. I mean, first you should look at all the multinationals that are working in Egypt, and in spite of what's happened in the last three years, a lot of them are growing. A lot of them are investing. A lot of them are are, are making money. So, and I, and I do believe that, I'm not going to say 100%, but I think 99% of multinationals do not indulge in corruption uh, in, in, in Egypt or, and to, you know, uh, in, in general. Oh, absolutely. I, mean, I, I think, I think I mean, no, I'm serious. Uh, and, and, you know, they do not bribe customs commissions, the, uh, commissioners, they don't bribe uh, 
the health so officials. They don't. The they, Christmas and Easter and, they, they, and everything else. I mean, not multi, 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 multinational, multinationals d d don't. I mean, you know, I uh, I send the sort of silver things to Exxon Marble and I get them back and say, I'm sorry, I can't. We can't accept that. Uh, and 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 that is the model that we want to. Uh, have all the Egyptians follow, all the Egyptian business people follow. And, and I think there are three kinds of corruption. Obviously, the, there's the, the greedy corruption of, uh, of somebody who's in a high position who will give you, a, allow you to get a tender that is not, that is not yours. Uh, and then there is the, uh, the low level uh, bureaucrat who opens your drawers so that you get what you supposed to get anyway and you throw in 10 pounds or 20 pounds uh, and I, I think there is there is that that is going on all the time the the, the door uh, that's what I that's what I mean uh, and I think there are institutions now that really follow and, and try to tackle corruption in Egypt but I agree with, uh, with my dear colleague here uh, that you should not go after corruption just by putting people in jail. I think it's the system, it's the transparency. Um, it's, you know, you can get your birth certificate now online in Egypt. I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> you, you did. Have to pay you can... to get the connection. <laughs> <laughs> you, have to get the you have to bribe your computer. <laughs> Anna, let me ask you a question. I mean, one of the things that people talked about when the Arab Spring happened, and it was true of Egypt, the, the rest of the world was in economic meltdown. And the changes we had in Eastern Europe the world wasn't in economic meltdown, and there was also the political reasons why people were more willing to spend money and get involved. Has Egypt really suffered because of the economic climate outside of Egypt, and it didn't get the help it deserved to make the change easier? It was hard for me. Um, I think it's hard to answer that question. I think the, the, the meltdown, as we call it, was really a meltdown of um, the, the advanced economies. It's really a meltdown of the U.S. and it's a meltdown of the EU because the rest of the world actually rebounded quite quickly. So countries that have very close trade ties or financial ties with either the U.S. or the EU actually were operating in a more difficult environment. So mm -hmm. you look at the Balkans, it looks terrible. You know, obviously Mexico with its ties with the U.S. But frankly, the rest of the world rebounded pretty quickly. And, you know, I don't know to what extent Egypt is actually dependent on those two big markets. I also, you know, I, you know, going back to the, to the point I think that we were talking about earlier is um, there's a temptation, you need, you need results right away, but actually these results in terms of jobs, they really do take time. I'm going to use an example from my own country, Spain. Spain finally did a, a half-decent labor market reform in the midst of the crisis. The crisis is not the right time to do labor market reform, but it was the depth of the crisis that forged the political agreement to do it. This is a set of reforms that are due since the mid-70s, because basically we had kept intact the labor market structures of the Franco dictatorship in a very different environment. So we were about 25 years late in doing these reforms. Um, very dual economy, a lot of the characteristics that you see in Egypt. Everybody moaned and complained, there's terrible reforms. The reforms by themselves weren't going to solve the problem, but what you're seeing right now in Spain is a recovery of growth, and with the recovery of growth, a much quicker translation into employment than we had seen in previous. Uh, now, you still have 25% unemployment because it's going to take several years for that to come back, but the dynamics are very positive. This sort of nasty, difficult political reform that was done three years ago that had to be done, that frankly, government should have done in a boom because that's the right time mm -hmm. to do it, but no one had the, in here it was a political will issue, not an implementation issue. Nobody had the guts to do it. This is going to pay off. It's going to pay off now and it's going to pay off um, for years to come and it's going to give young people more chances. So I think, you know, they are, it's better to do the reforms in a boom and not in a bust, but sometimes the political environment only allows you to do those reforms where you're in the, in, in the depths. And so I think for Egypt, it's, it's kind of a two-edged sword. I mean, the fact that things are difficult should, think, yeah. should catalyze change. At the same time, it does make people more impatient. Uh, and, and that's sort of a, a difficult balancing act. Um, well, as we've got to impatience, let me ask the audience for some questions, because um, I know this has been waived. So I'm going to take, first things first, questions, as opposed to uh, my life story in 
So in 15 minutes, no statements, please. We want questions at a short, sweet, and address the issues. I'll take a few at a time. Uh, hands raised, please. Uh, chap just in front of you, then. Hello, Jay, Jay Wright. Um, Sorry. You've got a big voice. I can hear you. Go on. OK. The sham mainly, uh, but others as well. Um, I'm glad you said there were jobs available, because I can name at least three studies right now that show there's large numbers of jobs available, but the education system isn't producing, particularly in higher education, people with the skills to fill them. Now, there's been a huge growth in private sector universities as well as private sector uh, schools. So what impact is that having? Um, should we also respond by trying to get more people into the private schools or spend more money and time pressuring the public schools to meet market needs? Okay, so education and market needs. Next question. Uh, as you're just next to the lady in the polka dot. Hello, my name is Caitlin Gallagher from the Bank Information Center. Um, I just am wondering, given the really difficult political state situation right now and the government not having a parliament, um, ha dealing with all of these different crises and the energy, uh, all kinds of different sec sectors, what political appetite is there to really address some of these institutional changes, um, capacity in institutions in Egypt, and some of the reforms that need to happen? And given this lack of political capacity right now in the government, what can international organizations like the World Bank do to support these processes? OK, take one more. We get someone from the back, just so you don't feel left out. Uh, there's a chap there who looks very eager. Must be a good question. <laughs> no, no, not you. No, I'll, I'll get to you, I promise, I promise, I promise, I promise. promise. The chap in the red tie. Yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, the question is this. We talk about corruption a lot, but uh, instead of going after it, like the gentleman said, can we actually see an opportunity <coughs> in dealing with corruption to transform it into jobs? And by that I mean here in the US, for example, we have lobbying firms, we have consult huge amounts of consulting firms. One time I went to pick up something from customs, and the gentleman told me, the officer told me, is it more than $3,000? I said, yes. He said, hey, take this 40-page paper and fill it out. I said, what? He said, or you can go and hire a consultant and they will do it for you for 50 bucks. Oh. So, okay. so what's, what is your comment on that? Okay, so there's an awful lot. Let me uh, ask the heifers first. There's an awful lot of corruption in Egypt, and if you can turn corruption into jobs, that should solve the problem, shouldn't it? <laughs> uh, yes. That's a good one. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I, I mean, uh, the uh, uh, corruption, as, as we see it in Egypt today, uh, is uh, stopping the creation of jobs. And actually, it is not just, uh, uh, as Ishab said, there are different types of corruption. Uh, there was an excellent re report uh, done by a gentleman who's sitting right here, <laughs> Mark, uh, uh, on, uh, on the political connections. And the fact that you, ha you, you had uh, firms that were politically well connected in Egypt. Uh, and the same is true in other places. Uh, the report also looked at Tunisia. Uh, those politically connected firms, uh, were, uh, all of government policy and regulations, uh, or a lot of them, went to protect those politically China. connected firms. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you would find higher uh, 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 entry restrictions in, in sectors where those uh, firms mm -hmm. are operating, high subsidies uh, uh, to, to those firms. Oh, they were receive, many of them were working in the energy, uh, energy intensive sectors and so on. So, what, from, what, from where I'm sitting, what, what I've been seeing is that high levels of corruption in Egypt have actually been discouraging the creation of new dynamic firms and therefore has, has has been discouraging the uh, uh, employment generation and employment growth. So the answer to your question is no. Uh, Anna, let me ask you about um, the, the latest question about education and the private sector. Where does education, what, what's the key role for education to play when it comes to the private sector? What, what does it need to do to actually translate the ambitions that are articulated here into reality? And how can it do it quickly? 
so let me let me answer this in two parts. First, and I don't want to sound like a broken record, I, I'm always very suspicious when I hear there are, there are all these vacancies, there are all the jobs, and nobody has the right skills. Because the question that comes to my mind is, why aren't firms then actually investing in the skills of mm -hmm. people? You can take a young person with the right soft skills, I want to come back to this, with the right motivation, the right attitude, you can teach them a lot of stuff. I don't think I knew a whole lot when I arrived that was useful when I arrived at the World Bank. And we, so, so there's always a question in my mind, what else is wrong that prevents That's firms right. who are looking for workers from investing in the skills that these people need to have? And there are a number of explanations. One is that the, 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 the kids, the, the young people, lack the very fundamental skills that you need to be able to build on. Some of those are soft skills, um, you know, determination, persistence, conflict resolution, and, and there is an issue. And some, some it's also true that, that you see young people going through the education system, getting a degree, but when you actually test what they've learned, their problem solving skills, their ability to interpret information, it's very weak. So there may be some very fundamental problems in the education system that are about that foundation of skills that then you build on. And then there may be things about the market that are preventing firms from making the investments that they should be making in workers that they're hiring. You know, what is the role of private versus public? I think you can debate that in, in education. I think you could debate that for a long time. Obviously, more and more we believe that the best thing is to have a very good set of standards and quality standards that universities have to meet and to have good links with employers. And you can have room for private and you can have room for public, but you need a very good accreditation system. I'm sorry, you wanted to come in. No, I just wanted to come in and go a step further. This is in the same region, uh, close by in Jordan. We did an experiment with the uh, graduates. We gave subsidies, uh, soft skills. We tested it. So some got that, some got this, some got both. And uh, basically, in the short run, the subsidy kicked in. So it was cheaper for firms. So they hired more and more people, and basically after two years it leveled off. You know, they, they were redistributing, and that's why I come to the private sector. We've built on that experiment. We've actually acknowledged that there are skill mismatches. We've actually conducted cognitive tests, matched employers, it's a paper coming out, employ, matched these kids. You know what, these kids don't go to all the interviews. When we ask them, they say, we, are, we have a prestige. This, uh, my education doesn't fit this job. Why? A, I want a government job. B, I don't want, I, I'm getting less than I will get if I wait. So there are deeper problems which manifest in all sorts of ways that go a little bit beyond just the soft skills and the incentives. Go on, jumping quickly. Uh, very, very quickly, because I think you're, you're both right. And uh, Anna is making an important point. However, we, we did a study on the education system in the Arab countries, not just Egypt, because uh, th that's why the, the Jordan uh, example is also useful. And the problem is that the children are not taught the soft skills that are needed. So uh, the, the, uh, the, ch the children are, are taught to learn things by heart. The kind of what we call the 21st century skills, uh, like working in, in teams, uh, uh, be, uh, uh, be, uh, being uh, uh, innovative, and so on and so forth. All of those soft skills that you would, would be looking for uh, are, are actually are not developed at all by the education system. In a sense, the education system is kind of suppressing those skills. Let, let me get to the third question. I'm going to ask you, Hisham, because you're the optimist in the group, because you have to be if you're a businessman and agent. Um, is there the political appetite to change the infrastructure, to change the institutions, and actually move this process forward? I think there is a realization uh, within the community and within the government that something has to be done and has to be done now. And I think what we have seen in the last few a couple of months about you know the subsidies and and uh, uh, and well, the minimum wage although that's it's controversial uh, even more controversial is the maximum wage for, <laughs> no, the public, for the public sector workers and the bankers and so on um, uh, there is a uh, a will to do something and actually to do it before parliament because parliament if it's really uh, diverse and elected and so on it's not going to be as easy to just take a decision and do it and I think uh, the, this government is, will be trying to do as much as possible within the uh, next uh, few months. And I'm, up, I'm still optimistic. optimistic yeah. I'm still optimistic. Uh, another round of questions. We'll take another three. This chap here. Uh, do you want to get a microphone? Hang on for a second. The lady will come to you. 
Thank you, Mahfouz Tadros, World Bank retiree and the proud Egyptian. <laughs> Shouldn't the private, formal private sector pay the minimum wage like the, the public sector is doing? And wouldn't that give something to the guys who went to Tahrir Square that saying they have a change? Oh this is my first question. My second uh, question. I'm going to take one, otherwise everyone will start having a right. It'd be just like time. <laughs> <laughs> just take one from you. That was the best one I best I get anyway. No, you no, I have another one which is important. I'll come back to you later if nobody else wants to ask a question. It's called democracy. We are trying it here. It doesn't work anywhere else. Uh, chat there. Got dressed up for the event, so he's a question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Hussein from Egypt. Uh, I want to ask how viable are reforms that whose bills are only paid by the poor when you ask, for example, for dismantling uh, a minimum wage while at the same time you don't target or don't tackle the big fish where is the military economic empire that's literally eating lunch, breakfast and dinner of the private sector in Egypt. Okay, big fish. Uh, next question. Chuck there on the edge, who I know has been desperate for 20 minutes. Yes, I have a, uh, uh, my name is Shahadas Banerjee. I'm a retired economist from the World Bank. Um, I have a simple question. Why has the bank's advice not had a meaningful impact? I did a similar study 37 years ago. Private sector development. I think I should ask you the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, we have to ask ourselves, you know, meaningfully, what really are those impediments? Okay, uh, that's, because, that's, okay. A, that's a question. Okay, um, I'm going to ask, you've just written another report 37 years later. <laughs> are you going to be standing here 37 years from now saying, no. <laughs> I wasted my time? Um, I don't know, in, in, you know, we do. I don't know how to answer whether we have an impact or not, I think. I think, but you have to create that impact by many in many ways including heightening the debate discussion among people way beyond the government and I think we're trying to do that I think there's a fundamental difference when you said will things change will things change I think from before if I look at Egypt prior to 2010 and now I would say that I think the new government of whoever it is has learned that they, it won't, people are not going to be quiet, right? That sort of, uh, that social compact that worked earlier, they've manifested that. So if I were the government, I would. Do we all agree that that's fundamentally changed Egypt? Yeah, can I, can I raise, hey, raise your hand, otherwise be all day. <laughs> Oh, yeah. well, there we go. So, but so it's not Egypt only that changed, it's also the World Bank that changed. 37 <laughs> years ago, no, it's, it's true. 37 years ago, the World Bank's reports uh, only went to the government. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, today, uh, uh, they're discussed broadly and, and widely in, in society. So the, both sides have changed, which makes me more hopeful that this time around they will listen to you. You should have come here 37 years ago and talked about your report. It would have changed everything. And then people like you can write about it. And, in, in, you know? Indeed we can, and we shall. So I'm going to ask uh, uh, Hisham a question now. Why don't you give minimum wage in the private sector? Not you personally. I mean, maybe yeah, you personally. maybe. <laughs> I give maximum weight. No, <laughs> no I, I think it's it's a point about uh, uh, either having a job or not having a job. And I, I think there are some industries uh, that if you implement the minimum wage, uh, they're just going to fire a quarter of the of the, of the people, uh, and and then they will go to in the informal sector. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think it's 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 a balance. I, I think the minimum wage is something that. Uh, on a human level is a must. Uh, on the economics and the, the, the way firms work, I think it has to be worthwhile to, to, the to do that. You want to follow up on that? Yeah, I want to follow up on the, on the presumption that some of these reforms hurt the poor. Because I hear it a lot when you talk about removing energy subsidies or raising them in, or lowering the minimum wage. Um, very few of the poor are actually in jobs with a minimum wage. And energy subsidies is the classic example. A lot of times government says, oh, I don't want to touch the subsidies because that hurts the poor. You actually show the incidents, who's benefiting from the subsidies, and they're disproportionately benefiting the rich. Now, I'll tell you, know, this is very much the case in Ukraine, where we've had this whole dialogue right now, is the prime minister saying, well, I am not going to touch those subsidies because of the poor. And then you show that actually the mega subsidies are going mm -hmm. to the rich and to the oligarchs. Yeah. And when you actually show that, and you say, you know, you take these away, you save money, you put in place a targeted safety net, or you put in a lifeline um, tariff for the poor, 
you actually are much more pro-poor. So this is just to make a comment. I think we need to be very careful when we make statements about reforms that hurt the poor. You need to have the evidence that actually it is the poor benefiting from that policy. Because a lot of the policies we're talking about, regulations in the labor market, um, tortilla subsidies in Mexico were argued as a pro-poor policy, except the rural poor didn't buy tortillas. They made their own. So I mean, that was all going to the urban middle class. Most of these policies that we hear so much noise around are targeted to groups that are politically powerful. The middle class, the urban middle class, or the rich. So I think just the point that we need to look at who is benefiting from the policy, and that requires some very careful analysis. And then, if it is going to hurt the poor, you design the policies to protect the poor. Okay, let's get to the third question. I'm going to ask you, Hafez, the big fish, fish question. Um, what do we do with the big fish? It was an elephant earlier in the conversation, now it's a big fish. What do we do about the big fish in the room, which is the army that can do pretty much what it wants, when it wants, how it wants in Egypt, no matter what reforms may be in this report? Well, uh <laughs> and, and do that brief. Uh, well, uh, I'll be very, very brief. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm not sure uh, what, uh, I mean, uh, from an economic policy perspective, I'm not sure what can be done. Uh, what, what we want to do is push for uh, more, m more transparency, more accountability, uh, and, the, uh, and that should be true for all of the public sector, including the military. Uh, so all of those military factories and military investments outside, I mean, they, they say, well, we need to keep the military expenditures uh, confidential and so on. Th that is something, the security aspects aside, but the economics uh, aspect needs to be uh, 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 transparent and, and, and clear. So uh, I think just by continuously pushing for greater transparency and accountability across the entire economy, that should include uh, the, uh, military enterprises as well. Okay, I've got time probably, unless Kate yeah. tells me otherwise. No, we haven't. Yeah. So yeah. I'm not going to ask you for any more questions. Oh, yeah. I need to ask what the thing is for. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised nobody asked. No, this is just an example. Of what the producers. This is, not a, this is just an example of an Egyptian company that has invested in 30 villages in taking cotton ah. and making uh, these organically uh, uh, no sort of uh, standard uh, for, for, for babies. Uh -huh. It's pure Egyptian cotton. It's, uh, it's made, they've, they've got all these villages and all these women working Wonderful. and making these and being sold here from San Jose, California, and it's called Under the Nile, and look it up, it's a fantastic, it's a, I'm, I'm not a shareholder, but it's a, <laughs> it's a fantastic example of how, how you can do good and be a good social entrepreneur. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to thank my guests, uh, not my guests, your guests, uh, Hafez Ghana and Hisham Fermi, uh, Anna Ravenga, and Tara for spending how many years on this report? I do hope. <laughs> one and a half. One and a half. I do hope that 37 years. We've got 36 years now, more years to go. <laughs> we will not be asked that question when the uh, Middle East Institute hosts another World Bank uh, report. They'll be saying how wonderful it was 37 years ago to have seen all the change. But thank you for coming. It's been a great event.